Hello again, everybody. Uh, take uh, half a minute to reorganize and we will start promptly. Okay, hello again. I'm happy to see that we maintain most of the audience for the next session. The next session is a title examination during times of uncertainty, the times that we are amidst of. And uh, the aim of the session is to allow conference participants to gain a greater understanding of how examination organizations form around the world have dealt with the pandemic and how they plan to deal with similar events in the future. Um, to, to that end, uh, we start the session with three panelists, each saying briefly, uh, each panelist will have four or five minutes, how their organization dealt with the pandemic uh, by making changes to normal arrangements and how they plan to deal with similar events in the future. Next, we will have three more speakers, uh, which will share with us their experiences. Uh, once again, each one will have four to five minutes to, uh, to speak. Finally, we'll open the floor for discussion and we'll be very happy to hear from whoever wishes to share with us his or her experience of uh, how they dealt uh, with the, how their examination board or organization dealt with the pandemic in the past year or almost two years. Uh, once again, Navid Yusuf from Aga Khan University Examination Board in Pakistan will moderate the second part of this session. Uh, I want to introduce our three panelists and I hope that all three of them are here. I managed to monitor two. The first, the, the first speaker will be Wayne Wesley from the Caribbean Examination Council. The second speaker will be Rufus Polia from the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. And the third speaker will be uh, Cindy Chu from Hong Kong Examination and Assessment Authority. Uh, when are you with us? I couldn't find you in the audience. Yes. Uh, when you're good, here. good afternoon. Okay, good to uh, see you. Ben Simmons, and yes, I'm here, right here. You are welcome to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you have a presentation you want to share, or you'll just? No, uh, I'll, I'll I'll just speak from. Just speak. Once you're ready, I'm ready to speak uh, for about a couple of minutes, and then. Uh, okay, I think we are completely ready for you. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much, moderator, fellow panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Let me first express my gratitude to be invited to participate in this important panel discussion, <clears throat> sorry, on examinations during times of uncertainty, and in particularly the challenges and implications for the future. The capability and capacity of all normative systems were and continue to be tested, revealing the inadequacies and vulnerabilities within the regional education system. Therefore, the emerging imperative for member states is the development of a greater level of resilience in the education sector. This, at the very least, requires a robust and sustainable transformation of our development, and development infrastructure and organizational systems to become responsive and agile. The complexity of the challenges at the level of each member state was exponentially transferred to regional entities that must operate across member states. An added dimension to the complexity is that each member state had its own unique education system with varying levels of resources and approaches to its curriculum delivery. Within the regional construct of CARICOM, the transformation process of teaching, learning, and assessment have emerged 
as the common platform for regional discourse in terms of cooperation and collaboration for the development and preservation of standards. The specific challenges faced by CXC under the COVID-19 pandemic are as follows. The firstly, adjusting for learning loss. Across the region, there were different mm -hmm. levels of preparedness, which made it difficult to determine what aspect of the syllabus to be assessed. The inability to exercise innovative flex operational flexibility for assessment modification and development. And this was due largely in part to low uptake and inability to administer our e-testing platform and also the limitations of the modified approach that we had to implement because of the learning loss. Secondly, standardization across territories, different assessment standards within and across the territories made it difficult to quality assure. The SBA was a common standardization measure across the region in this regard. Maintaining, thirdly, maintaining the integrity of the examination. Implementation of an approach that reflects the best arrangement and adequate safeguards for quality assurance. Varying levels of syllabus coverage have to be considered, varying standards of SBA, inherent weaknesses in the preparation for these, varying standard of assessment across region and even within the member state and across and within schools of member states. Fourthly, we had to be facilitating a regional consensus. In other words, territories having different demands, concerns that must be rationalized and resolved towards a consensus. Our challenge therefore was to strike a delicate balance, knowing that not all will be completely satisfied. The consultation process in achieving this consensus was particularly difficult within a regional context with global implications as this as each member state was affected in varying degrees as a result of the pandemic and fi uh, and fifthly administration logistics and scheduling the other challenge that we had was the, to determine the most convenient period for examinations the factors to balance were safety protocols matriculation concerns, the hurricane season that we had to face within the region and the start of the academic school term. The release of results in terms of persons who want to be admitted into university and trying to balance these pandemic. And finally, accounting for the psychosocial impact on our stakeholders, especially our students. Having that experience last year, this year, the strategy for examination took into account those particular challenges. And accordingly, we had to delay the start of our examinations this year. We also contemplated sharing topics, particularly on paper two, uh, because on paper one, the entire syllabus would have been tested. We created a deferral, created facility, a deferral facility to accommodate those, to accommodate those who were who deemed it that they are not fully that prepared not fully for the exam. We allow students to defer their SBA scores for another sitting. We provided extension to submission of the SBAs and all that in order to account for the psychosocial impact and the challenges the region educational system would have encountered during the pandemic. <clears throat> These are indeed unprecedented times and times of uncertainty. The Caribbean Examinations Council is by no means immune to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence, the CXC strategy from as far back as 2015 sets out a vision of transformation and change to reposition its operation and assessment in the region on an e-platform for greater levels of efficiency, quality, and security. However, while some progress would have been made, the full realization of the outcomes is yet to be achieved. In recognition of this, CXC is now implementing a new five-year strategic plan for the period 2021-2025.
The vision is to create a digitally transformed enterprise providing quality, relevant, and globally recognized educational services. To this end, the strategic plan represents a structured system of transformation to include research and development, artificial intelligence, digitalization of systems, and an inclusive decision-making framework. To conclude, the COVID-19 experience has served as a, to highlight several weaknesses in the regional education system and points to the urgent need to reorient our approach to its sustainable development. It is important to note that digital transformation of our education system is only an enabler for operational flexibility and not a panacea. Other interventions dealing with the psychosocial interventions are also critical. The overall we lesson are plan, past our time, so can you Yes, I'm finished, I'm finished, I'm at the end. The overall lesson learned from COVID-19 is the awakening of a collective consciousness that of the inadequacies or normative systems and awareness and indeed the collective effort to reimagine and develop an inclusive framework. Critical to this response of building resilience is the preservation of the examination of integrity to instill confidence and trust in the certification included to validate competence. It is more than just building back stronger. It is building back sustainably. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Wayne. Thank you, it seems like quite an effort. And uh, we won't waste any moment and we'll move to Rufus. Rufus, it seems that you're ready. Yes, you have a presentation uh, that somebody will upload for you if I understood correctly, or you are uploading your presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, to our chairperson and uh, let me bring you warm uh, greetings from a sunny South Africa. And let me also extend my special appreciation to the conference organizers uh, for allowing me to uh, represent the South African examination system and uh, the implications with regard to the pandemic that has certainly taken all of us by surprise. And the South African examination system was catapulted into uncertain, trying and challenging times. And I think conferences of this nature will allow us to share our experiences, share knowledge, and look at the future uh, with a greater sense of confidence. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, highlight certain key points. And on my next slide, I provide an indication of how did the South African, South African examination system respond to uh, the pandemic. There was certainly school closure because of uh, the uh, danger of infections. And this resulted in reduced teaching time. We had to accommodate learners at schools uh, when schools re reopened due, due to social distancing. But the biggest impact is that in South Africa, we have two examinations. We have a June examination and a November examination. And the June examination had to be canceled because that was the height of the pandemic. And we had to administer a, a combined examination. But what I think the pandemic revealed is that it accentuated the inequalities in our schooling system. South Africa is a deeply diverse country with an urban, rural, and a deep rural uh, component. And, and as a result, no one size fits all. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we looked at some of the remedial measures and we had to trim the curriculum, focus on the core aspects of what is essential for learners to move into the next grade, uh, we amended the assessment requirements. And in terms of the examination, uh, we had to extend the number of exam venues, uh, given the space requirements, administered exams for candidates with symptoms, and even for those that tested positive. Uh, in the case of our marking, we tried to adopt the bio bubble approach, 
where that was possible. But the one aspect that I want to focus on, which comes in with the next slide, is that the South African national examination system uh, examines the national senior certificate, which is a three-year qualification. And this has certain implications in the environment we find ourselves. And this national senior certificate is supported by a national curriculum statement, which in the main covers three years. And we then have what is referred to as a national examination guideline, which in the main focuses on, on grade 12. But here comes the challenge that was faced and, and moving on to the next slide is that in terms of the certificate, the certificate comprises of key, two key assessment components, school-based assessment and examination. And given the capacity of our teachers, we had to go or in our policy statements at the moment, we have a 25% school-based assessment and the bulk of the assessment focuses on exams, which is 75%. Now, moving on to the next slide, we had to make a change with the pandemic, uh, given the fact that now had to be a greater focus on teachers and, and school-based assessment. So as a result, we kept the grade 12 intact and did not tamper with the curriculum, neither did we tamper uh, with the assessment, given the importance of the grade 12 examination, which leads to the certificate. We amended the weighting in terms of the grade 10 and grade 11, which are the two years preceding the grade 12 examination. And there was now a move from 75% examinations to 40% examinations in grade 10 and grade 11, and the remaining 40% uh, or the remaining 60% was based on school-based assessment. So the focus was certainly now shifted to the teacher in the classroom, given the fact that syllabus coverage varied from school to school, from district to district, and from province to province, and hence standardized examinations could not be the option. Now here is the outcome. On the next slide, we look at the numbers that now moved from grade 11 into grade 12. The first block represents the numbers that we had in grade 12 in 2020. Now, the number there was 607,000. But in 2021, given the fact that we changed the assessment format in grade 11, we now have an increased number of learners in grade 12 an increase of 128,000. Now, this is the fundamental question that I would like to share uh, with our esteemed participants on the, on the next slide. The change assessment requirements, does this mean that the assessment standards in grade 11, given the fact that it had a higher uh, school-based assessment weighting of 60% was substandard? and therefore more learners were able to meet the requirement and now move into grade 12 in, in 2021. And obviously that resulted in an increased pass, pass rate from grade 11 into grade 12. Now, one of the downsides of this is that given the fact that in grade 11, the year preceding, the focus was on school-based assessment, it means that the first fully-fledged exam that these learners that were in grade 11 last year will experience in, in grade 12. And, and as a result, there is concern that in grade 12 this year, there will be a higher failure rate, given the fact that learners were not exposed to fully fledged examinations in, in grade 11. Now, moving on to the next slide is, is the big question that we ask. Rufus, and the big question, are... and I'm hoping, Rufus, we are kind of uh, above the time. So can you please wrap up and keep the questions for, this, for the question and answer session? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm almost done. Should we revert to the original weighting of 75-25 or should we retain the 60-40? Is the higher weighting of SBA providing a more appropriate assessment regime? And, and my last slide, uh, which simply says that 
in dealing with the pandemic, we've realized that we need to focus on the core curriculum that is more skills-based. There's a need for deeper learning rather than superficial coverage. And we need to develop more of a formative assessment culture in, in our schools. And this calls for improved teacher competency in this area. We are exploring enhanced distance learning strategies and most importantly, getting learners to take responsibility for their learning. And, and important to all of this is improving the capacity of our teachers to be able to manage school-based assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rufus. I think that everybody uh, can correspond to your issues and questions. And I hope we have enough time to deal with the questions or with the issues you raised in the question and answer uh, period. And our third speaker is Cindy. Cindy, you are there. And I think yes. I know you're there. Uh, OK, you have your presentation on. You're yes. all set. Yes, um, since my internet is not very stable, I have made a video. Oh, yes, uh, we will be sharing the share. video. Yes, let me share. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Yes, okay. Cindy, your video is on. Yes. Uh, Can you Cindy, go? Cindy, uh, you need to Can stop you... sharing okay, and sorry. share. And um, before you share, when you press share screen, make sure mm -hmm. at the bottom of the window that appears that the share sound and optimize for video clips are ticked before you share your video. So oh. we can hear your sound. <laughs> Okay, let me share again. Let me see. Uh, we also have your presentation. Do we want you want us to share it? Um, uh, it doesn't sound it very doesn't well. It doesn't work well. No. Um, uh, can you let us let us, share it. Let, let, let us share it. Yes, let yes, us yes. share it. Sorry. One minute. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. This is Cindy Chu from the Hong Kong Examinations and Assessment Authority. It's nice to be here to share with you the contingency and precautionary measures we have done for the 2021 Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education Examination, HKDSE in Hong Kong this year. Sorry, can you hear my voice? Yeah, which I would like uh, it's a bit low, but... Uh, um. I can hear it. You okay. can hear it. Okay, okay. okay. Let, let's continue hear it fine then. as well. Yeah, perfect then. Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education Examination, HKDSE in Hong Kong this year. Another new arrangement this year, which I would like to focus on as we call the isolated exam venue. What is mean by isolated is remote. It's a remote area. Actually, it is a quarantine center. This is the first time for HKDAA to hold exam at Penny State Quarantine Center, we call PDQC, this year. Actually, this um, quarantine center is located nearby the Hong Kong Disneyland. Seven candidates undergoing compulsory quarantine were arranged to seek the exam involving nine subjects and 11 exam days there. The government policy for allowing candidates to seek the exam in PDQC was just put in place around one month before the start of the exam. We need to wait scan time and to ensure that the center and relevant exam arrangements were properly set up. And finally, they came up with the following arrangement. And you can see the picture of the quarantine center. We have reserved 16 blocks of room there. Each block contains 16 rooms. It's on the upper floor and the other is on the ground floor. This zone is regarded as a study zone. It is used for isolating close contact. Besides arranging the venue, we also carry out urgent recruitment and training of invigilation staff. You can see the picture. Um, they are under the PPE training by the health department and also they uh, try to um, do the invigilation work outside the room and it's quite hot there. 
and also we set up the exam room by posting the poster into um, at the door and also set up a mobile device for recording purpose. And for the room setup, you can see within the room, there's a toilet and uh, a bed and two desks with two chairs. Each candidate was arranged to see the exam uh, nearby the window uh, to be visible uh, when doing visual ages. To ensure the fairness of the exam, you can see a mobile device was set up to record the exam proceedings. And it's hard for invigilation staff to work at PPQC under sweltering heat. They are in full set of gear and monitor the exam proceedings outside the exam rooms without any air conditioning. At that time, we were not yet vaccinated. So we need to put on the whole set of PPE under extremely hot weather. And it's quite difficult to drink water or eat something during the three to four hours of exam. If they need to drink or need to go to the toilet, they need to remove the PPE and then to put on a new PPE again, which will waste another one hour. So to ensure that candidates in every independent room can hear the announcement and the broadcast of the singing exam, invigilators make announcements right outside the exam room. Sometimes they use a loudspeaker and each candidate was provided uh, with a backup radio for listening exam in case of reception problem. Those who need help from invigilators or wanted to go to the toilet had to show the notes card outside the window to summon the invigilator. After the exam, the candidate was asked to clean the hand with alcohol hand sanitizer before putting the answer script and other exam related materials into a plastic bag for collection by the invigilator. Just like ordinary people, um, the exam script also need to go through a 14 day quarantine period. You can see our staff just um, seal the script into a box and the box will be locked in that cabinet in the security room for 14 days. And after the quarantine period, the script will be taken out from the room and returned to the HKEAA scanning center. When it back to our office, and you can see our scanning staff took out the script carefully in the designated room, and they sanitized the script and then take out the speckle and then scan the script into our system for marking. As a conclusion, with the concerted effort and flexibility of colleagues from various divisions and government departments, we finally managed to stay the high stick HKDSE exam in this isolated exam venue. It was really an unforgettable experience, but hopefully in next year, we won't have to conduct the exam as that in that isolated center. I uh, hope the pandemic situation will be improved next year. Last but not least, the standard of the exam was not compromised, although a range of new measures were put in place in a short time. That's all for my sharing. Uh, if you'd like to know more about the PBQC, you're welcome to approach me by this email address. Thank you very much for your participation. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Cindy. It's extremely impressive. I, I can't see how any other country can beat your wiggle. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Hope you can hear clearly. <laughs> Yes, but we could read it as well, so it worked. Thank you. Okay, okay. It's, it's really it's very impressive. <laughs> okay, so we had our speakers, and uh, I want to thank our panelists. And uh, Navid, I think it's your turn to take over, present our next three speakers, and take the session from here on. Navid? Yes, yes, okay. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you thank so much, you. Dr. Anna. Um, I will take one from here, and we have three more speakers who will share their own experiences, how did they manage the examinations during COVID-19 pandemic in their own parts of the world. The three speakers we have for the next part of the session are Clementine Sumis Garrises from Examinations Council of Namibia, David Njenger, Kenya National Examination Council, and Dennis Opos from Ofqual, UK. If the presenters can please switch on their cam cameras and indicate if they are here, the three presenters. I can see David here, I can see Dennis. Yes, hello. And hello. if we have Clementine here today. 
or any rep rep representative from Examinations Council of Namibia. Right, so without wasting further time, I would now request David from Kenya National Examination Council uh, to share their experiences of managing exams during COVID. Uh, each presenter will have five minutes to present and I will politely remind the presenters at four minutes. Thank you. Over to you, David. Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, greetings from uh, Kenya, Abarizenu. Um, the, the, the first issue is that uh, when COVID kicked in, there was a lot of uncertainty in Kenya. Uh, people are not sure uh, how long the effect is going to last, how the spread that will happen, the effects that it will have on populations, on schools. So there was a lot of uncertainty around that. But in a span of about three months, it was clear after we recorded our first case that uh, schools could not remain open. And uh, so there was a policy that all schools and colleges and universities or institutions of learning should, should close. And there was no way of estimating how long it would take before schools could, could reopen. And unfortunately at that time, we were administering some of the examinations for for teacher education and the technical examinations. We were doing the practicals. So everyone went home and the exams had to be abandoned. And after three months, that's when everyone discovered, hey, this thing is going to last longer than, uh, than we thought. And the government set up a task force that was supposed to start asking then if this is going to stay on for a long time, then what are we going to do? Of course, from the end, of uh, instruction, government tried many things, learning through uh, radio, uh, TV, ICT, all those methods were tried with different levels of success, of course, with uh, the different socioeconomic uh, status of the children, some could access, others couldn't. Now, the task force uh, had to also address the question of uh, transition, because we have a major transition that is going to happen in 2023, where we'll have a double intake in uh, the equivalent of grade seven across the different uh, examination structures in the world. And so the task force had to make a decision that we have to reopen for the examinations classes only. The advantage we had with that is that uh, learners could recover uh, to some extent because uh, the, all the teachers in a school would be concentrating on a smaller uh, population of learners. And hence, when we administered the examinations on that examination class, unlike the fear that had been expressed that all oh, these children are going to fail and all that, there was no significant difference between how they have been performing and how they performed in that particular uh, exam. Uh, of course, like South Africa and all the other countries, we had to administer this under very strict protocols of social distancing, increasing the examination uh, rooms, the marking centers, and of course, that also brought the challenge of the costs. I won't go into that because I think that's almost generic. We also administered a study to establish the extent of the learning loss on the learners in the other levels. And uh, that study helped us so that we could provide schools with interventions on specific areas where the learners seemed to have lagged behind a lot. So as we reopened for all the other learners, at least there was an intervention that could be taken by all schools on what to do with the learners. The biggest lesson we have learned in Kenya is that we have to invest in a lot of research and innovation. There will be many other disruptions, not necessarily COVID, but we anticipate that the uncertainties that we're experiencing in the world today, we can't sit back and uh, assume that all will be okay as it has always been. And so we are investing in a lot of research and innovation. Fortunately in Kenya for grade three and grade four in the last two years, we have been uh, using ICT to administer school-based assessments. So we feel that if we can up in this uh, particular area of ICT, 
then perhaps it could help us mitigate to some extent some of the effects that uh, would come with either COVID or any other disruptions that may come our way. So thank you very much. That is the experience of Kenya. Asante. Thank you very much, David, in time. Um, and now I will hand over to Dennis Opos to share his experience uh, during COVID-19. Dennis, over to you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from England. Uh, and it's England I'm uh, talking about today. Uh, so I'm talking about GCSEs and A-levels. Uh, GCSEs are taken by just about all our 16-year-olds. And then about half of those go on to take A-levels at 18. Um, GCSEs and A-levels use a mixture of exams at the end of the course and school-based assessment. Uh, the balance between the two varies quite a lot. Uh, in most of the traditionally academic subjects, exams provide most of the uh, assessment. Right, um, so 2020, um, the summer exams were cancelled in March because schools and colleges have been closed by the pandemic. Um, uh, schools and colleges were asked to produce great estimates for their students. They were asked, what would these students have got if they'd taken their exams? And then these centre assessment grades were to be standardised using statistical models. So uh, the results came out. Uh, there was an uproar in the country. And the uproar was because the standardisation process had resulted in about 40% of the grades being lower than the, those that the colleges and schools had submitted. So as a response to the uproar, the standardization process was abandoned and the original center assessment grades were issued to students. Uh, as you'd expect, that led to some inflation. So for example, 38% uh, of all the A-level candidates that year were awarded a grade A or A star. Uh, and usually that figure would have been 25, 26, 27%. So quite a lot of grade inflation, and that led to uh, about 4% more students going to university than had happened in the previous year. So on to 2021. Uh, 2021, the summer exams got cancelled, this time in January, um, and a different system put in place. Uh, grades were to be determined by teachers based on evidence they had, evidence of assessment. Um, they could choose uh, what uh, evidence they use. They could use mock exams, they could use class test, they could use school-based assessments that's already been completed. And the students were only assessed on the content they've been taught. So if there was some learning loss, there was some compensation for that. So uh, a different system uh, that when the results came out in the summer, that was received pretty well. Uh, what Ofqual has been doing is to uh, try to find out what our main stakeholders think about um, all of this. Um, and there were three waves of a survey we completed up until July. Um, and there's a, another wave uh, that uh, has been carried out, but uh, the data is yet to be um, finalised. So what did, did our stakeholders think? Well, students had this overwhelming sense that the arrangements for grading were unfair. Um, I should emphasize they were asked this before their results came out, so they may have changed their minds, but fairness was their key issue. Uh, teachers were worried about um, the consistency of grading. Um, so fairness, again, in a sense, uh, they were worried about teacher workload, uh, which may have caused more stress for teachers. And certainly they thought that if they were doing all this extra work, they should be paid for it. Uh, higher education were worried about bias and um, that was to some extent a concern, I think, about uh, grades being inflated. Um, many employers talked about uh, worries about the unconscious bias that teachers would have when assessing and a, a, a lack of um, transparency within the system. And finally, parents, uh, their main concern was around the unfairness of grades that they thought students were going to receive. And that was partly because, of course, many students hadn't received the usual level of teaching or support this year because schools and colleges have been closed for periods. Um, and maybe compounded by the concerns from 2020, 
uh, they were worried that students from schools that performed less well would be judged differently. So uh, quite a lot of concern. As I say, this was um, before the results came out, um, but um, nonetheless, uh, there's issues here about um, confidence. So government policy for next summer is to reinstate the exams. Um, there is this reduced confidence among stakeholders uh, about um, GCSE and A-level grades being reliable, free from bias, comparable across schools and colleges, useful for job recruitment. We're getting far less positive responses from our stakeholders than we used to get back in 2019, 2018, the years before the pandemic. So there is something about how their confidence in teacher assessment has uh, taken a bit of a dive. Uh, and we'll need to try to do something to regain that confidence. But one thing it, it does say, certainly to me, is that um, in the debates we've had about should we be using more teacher assessment, more school-based assessment in our system, it'll be hard to do that when the evidence suggests that confidence in school-based assessment seems to be somewhat low. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dennis, for sharing the experiences of examinations in England during COVID-19. Um, time for question and answers and some discussions as a way forward for us as examination boards. Uh, I will request the panelists uh, if they can come on the screen again uh, so we can take the questions from the audience and take the discussion forward. So I will invite Wayne Wesley, Rufus Polia, and Cindy Chu uh, to please switch on their cam cameras and be available for the questions. Uh, we have started receiving questions in the chat box already. And of course, this is a very uh, uh, relevant topic uh, and a challenge for each one of us during COVID. Uh, the question, the first question we received on the chat box was from Anne. However, Anne thinks that the survey done in England as presented by Dennis has addressed the question. I will post the question anyway to the speakers if they, if they would like to respond. The knock-on impact that Rufus speaks of is a real issue for the system as a whole. If we agree that this year's grade 12 will be affected more negatively in their learning by the pandemic, is it fair to the cohort as a whole to rely on teacher assessments for these learners who will want to go to university without an examination that essentially rank learners? If, if any of these speakers would like to respond. Rufus, any yeah. thoughts on this? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, well, in terms of the South African context, uh, and, and I think uh, Dennis has also highlighted the entire issue relating to school-based assessment and the reliability of, of school-based assessment. Now, in terms of what the plan is with regard to the grade 12s, we still maintain the examination component. So the exams in grade 12 will still constitute 75%. And the school-based assessment will only comprise 25%. So the bulk of the assessment in terms of the grade 12 year for 2021 would be an examination focused. And what happens in South Africa is that that 25% still gets standardized to the examination. So we make sure that there is a comparison between the school-based assessment scores and the examination. And, and I'm hoping that I got Anne's question fully in terms of her concern about, can we move to school-based assessment uh, in, in the grade 12 year? And I am saying, we're still keeping the examination versus the school-based assessment component in the grade 12 year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rufus. 
I believe that responds to the question well. Uh, we have one more question for you, Rufus. However, I will give you some break and move on to questions to other panelists before I come back to you. So a question has been posed by Shazad Jeeva uh, for Cindy. And the question yes. is, is taking exams of children who are not well due to the COVID-19 is fair? Being in isolation and in quarantine can negatively impact their psychological health and of course the performance. What do you oh, say? Um, uh, actually, the one who go to a uh, quarantine center is not actually infected. They are just the close contact of some infected persons. They do not have any syndromes. So they are uh, quite well to take the exam. Uh, alternatively, uh, they have another option. They can choose for assessment on their results based on their school results, or they can actually take the exam. They can apply for us to take the exam. Uh, so uh, uh, they should be... Um, good enough for the exam since this is very important for them for university admission and they have been working for three years to take the uh, real exam so they prefer to choose the real exam instead of doing the assessment thank you thank you, thank you so much i i hope this clarifies uh, uh, the context and the challenge another question is for dennis dennis the question for you is uh, can you expand on what steps of call plan to take to bring the confidence back of the stakeholders? Okay, uh, I don't think I know fully what the answer to this is, but um, in, in the short term, when we get to next year, we're going to return, we hope, to the sorts of um, exams and uh, teacher assessments that we had in 2019 and, and previously. So the sort of assessment we're asking teachers to do is rather more different, it's rather more controlled than what was going on this year, where we were saying, make use of any evidence you've got, carry out what assessments you think are appropriate, and then reach a conclusion. Uh, as with uh, most systems, our normal school-based assessment is, is rather more controlled than that. Uh, there, there will be specific tasks perhaps that have to be carried out. There will be uh, marking criteria and so on. So I think in the short term, what we'll be doing is uh, trying to provide reassurance that that style of teacher assessment, which we've got experience of going back many years, uh, will provide a reliable assessment that people can trust. Um, the, the difficult bit, I think, is, is more to do with the medium long term future, where certainly some would like to see us use more teacher assessment um, and that more teacher assessment may be a, a bit closer to what's been happening this year, which, as I say, uh, public confidence has, has um, dipped, certainly. Um, what will be interesting, of course, is we, we are asking people about their confidence in the run up to these exams. And I, I told you what they said. Uh, the results this year, you know, the students generally were pretty pleased with them because uh, they were, well, even higher than in 2020. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see when we analyze the data in, from uh, the post exam surveys, whether actually uh, <laughs> confidence has, has uh, risen at all uh, because they, they'll be happy with what they got. But uh, I've, I've no idea what, what they said, so we'll have to wait and see. Thank you uh, so much, Dennis, for the response. And I'm sure many, if not all, of the examination boards across the globe face similar challenges during COVID-19. I will come back to you, Rufus, on the question we received for you. And the question is again from Shazad Jeeva. The question states, you mentioned that the curriculum of grade 12 was not changed. How many academic days were available for the students to ensure that they complete the entire curriculum during COVID-19 times? Rufus, if you are there to respond. Uh, thank you, Naveed. Yeah, I think the, the important point with regard to the grade 12s in South Africa, I think uh, you're correct in saying that we did not trim the curriculum in grade 12. And there was a lot of debate around that. And the thinking was that uh, we don't want this class to be regarded as the class of 2020 uh, or the class of 2021, 
uh, that were the victims of COVID-19. And, and that stigma would certainly be with them. But what we did was we tried to recover the days lost when the country went through lockdown and there was no teaching and learning. And, and what we then did was that we extended the, the, the teaching time by shortening down on the school holidays. Uh, we now took the school year up to the middle of December. Normally we close schools by the end of November. But the other mechanism that was used to, to win back some time was we normally administer a June examination to the grade 12 learners. And that takes up about three to four weeks. So the June examination for grade 12 learners was canceled. So that allowed teaching and learning to continue during these, this period, which originally would have been scheduled for exam. So in essence, our grade 12s of 2020, and we're also hoping that the grade 12s of 2021 will have the normal teaching time to be able to cover the syllabus. But obviously it's not just about syllabus coverage, but given the fact that these learners are now working under conditions which are conducive to anxiety, stress, and it's the whole psychosocial issues that they need to deal with. And obviously that we cannot compensate with. But in terms of teaching time, we think that they would have had the normal teaching time of previous courts. Thank you, Naveed. Thank you so much, Rufus, for this elaborate response. And I'm sure many of us has learned these strategies uh, as a way forward. I will now hand over the forum to Enid as she likes uh, to share some very important lessons for us. Enid, over to you, and then I will go back to further questions. Thank you, Naveed. I just wanted to share one thing that we did in Israel with regard to the matriculation examinations. And what we did is provided each school with the average score that the school got uh, in the past three years uh, on each and every subject that was tested uh, via external examinations. So the message to the teachers and to the headmaster was, listen, this is more or less the level of achievement of your uh, students. And we kind of expect you that the average score, that the score that you'll give, that the average score that you'll provide to your teacher, to your, to your cohort on this specific uh, domain or subject will be somewhat in between these three scores. So we didn't penalize them, but we kind of hinted that where we expect they should be. And that conveyed the message to the teachers or the schoolmasters that we are monitoring the scores and we are monitoring the, the, uh, uh, um, the gap between the score that they give uh, to so-called external tests uh, as opposed to the score that the students got uh, in the previous year. And that worked pretty well. I think the message was well received and, uh, and we managed to, to, to close a bit the gaps and to reduce a bit the inflation that we saw in 2020. So just an idea. Thank you so much, Dr. Anat, for the suggestion. Um, we are moving closer uh, to the end time for the session. However, there are two very important questions and I think these two questions serve the original purpose of keeping the session in this con conference. Uh, I will directly jump to the two questions, one from Hanif Sharif, and the question states, how can exam boards assist the students who will perpetually be referred to as a COVID-19 cohort or a COVID-19 batch? And the question from Stuart is, do we want to return to the pre-pandemic approaches to assessing learners? Or do we want to reconfigure how we conceptualize assessment for the future? I think these are two very important questions for us to ponder on as we move forward uh, with our assessments and examinations. So I would like any of the speakers uh, to please feel free to share their thoughts on these two questions.
Wayne, if if you would like to share your thoughts um, as as a way forward for the examinations. Okay, Navid. Uh, certainly, I don't think in my own estimate and estimation and the experience here in the region that we can return to, to what existed before. I think now is the time to reimagine assessment. And, and, and one of that is uh, we now need to begin to think content versus competencies. And so in our assessment, do we focus on the volume of content to be covered? Are we focused on the critical competencies that students ought to demonstrate? Because in this age where knowledge is pretty much available anywhere, content can be had. I think what we really want to develop within our student is the capacity to critically think and assess. And so our assessment going forward should begin to deal with those critical competencies and not so much as we do now, on the coverage of an extensive syllabus with a lot of information, uh, but the critical competencies are not being assessed because students spend more time focusing on recalling that large volume of content rather than the critical skills to be demonstrated to say that here, I think I've garnered some expertise and that expertise now can be applied to any situation. And then you can say that person would have developed. So even now at the Caribbean Examination Council, one of the things we are looking at is, do we need to have such extensive examinations? Do we need to have, uh, can our examinations be flexible enough as we seek to go online and using digital uh, ways of testing students, that as you demonstrate a certain competence, we can move you to another level of competence. And once you master all levels of competence, then we can say whether or not you're a A student or a B student or a C student, or at least certify the competences that you have demonstrated. So I think we have to reimagine our assessment structure and format in order to take uh, advantage of the new norm that is coming where how can we quickly assess the critical competencies so that this idea as to whether or not this student can be compared with a, a, a student in prior year because of the volume of work they might have covered is non-existent because we have a set of competencies that students would be assessed against and demonstrate their skills in those areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. I cannot agree more with you that during such times, uh, it has made us realize that uh, lifelong learning skills, critical thinking and problem solving skills are the most important ones we need to ensure that our students develop. Uh, this is taking us to the end of the session. Uh, a couple of minutes left. I know we all have our commitments. I would like to thank again all the five esteemed speakers um, and naming again, Wayne Wesley from Caribbean Examinations Council, Rufus Polia from South Africa, Cindy Chu from Hong Kong Examinations and Assessment Authority, David Njengir from Kenya National Examination Council, and Dennis Opos from Ofqual UK, um, informing us about the different practices and problem solving regarding the administration of examinations and decisions for valid assessments, uh, which happened across the globe during COVID-19. Uh, thank you for very interesting questions and keeping us engaged. Uh, so thank you participants. And there is some very interesting engagement happening at the chat box. So if you are uh, not engaged in the chat box, please refer to the chat box and keep on engaging. I will now hand over the session back to Dr. Anath for her final comments and announcements, any announcements for tomorrow. Dr. Anath, over to you. Uh, your mic is mute. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, Navid, for a wonderful moderation and for helping out. And yeah, we are just about to close the session. I want to thank all the participants, the speakers, everybody. I want to remind you that there's another day tomorrow with uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentations and session. 
And Mary Petoniak, who is going to chair the session, asked me to ask you that everybody that is, go, that is presenting uh, uh, tomorrow, please uh, log in five minutes before the session so that you'll know that you are there and you're all set. <laughs> and uh, yes, we are, I think uh, nobody asked, but I'm sure that sometimes someone will ask if the presentations will be available. So we will, uh, we will make a round among all the presenters and ask each and every one of them if they're willing to share the, their presentations with us. And uh, whatever presentation will be available, we'll put it on the uh, IEA website. And I think this um, summarizes our first day. Um, I'm pleased. I hope you are too. And I hope to see you all tomorrow. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Good All right, thanks. Good Take it easy. You're good. Okay. Bye -bye. See you. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.